Hi, I'm Dr. Hacky Reitman. Welcome to another episode of Exploring Different Brains. And today we have a returning all-star, one of the Different Brains all-stars, Professor Stephen Shore of Adelphi University, who does so much for so many. He's on every continent around. I think he just returned from Taiwan, which I think is an island last time I checked. Stephen Shore, welcome back to Different Brains. Uh, well, it's great to be back. And yes, you're right. I was, I'm was i just back from Taiwan, came back a few days ago, and it's still an island, or at least it was when I left. So it probably still is. Now, how many continents have you been on? Uh, six. There's only one left. Which one is that? It's the one way at the bottom, at the Antarctica. Oh, nice. What was the biggest thing you learned during your Taiwan trip? I know you were teaching, but what did you learn? Uh, the biggest thing I learned was that there's a great desire in people to learn more about autism. So that's a good thing. And the challenges I find is that there's very few resources in Taiwan. Uh, I actually did my workshop for a school that's part of an international uh, consortium of English-speaking international schools. There's about a hundred of them in this consortium. And uh, this group is the special ed component, you might say. So, in, so it was really like uh, presenting in the United States because everybody spoke English. And they understood the laws of, you know, that surrounded special education. They knew what an IEP was. So it's not really a representative view of what actually is going on in Taiwan for the natives. In your travels, which countries would you say are way up here on, quote, doing the right thing for autism or doing their best? And which countries might you say have the farthest way to go? All right, well, looking at it that way, I, I think... What I found is the places such as Australia and England, New Zealand, uh, these are places that I've been to and I've seen some really good work being done there. Uh, there are other locations such as India and Russia where they've now become aware of what autism is. And so they've got the awareness piece. And what I find really encouraging is that even though there's challenges in terms of developing greater awareness and education for autistic people, they're reaching out to people in other countries that have a longer experience, such as in the United States, such as I. So for example, uh, in the United States, uh, we've had about 50 years of practice, and I emphasize the word practice, in special education. Uh, the other countries, uh, as being members of the UN and having signed on to the UN Convention of the Rights for People with Disabilities, which also include education, uh, they've developed some very nice looking special education laws that seem pretty similar to what we have in the United States. And in some cases, they're even better. But the real challenge they face is the implementation. I just came from a board meeting of the wonderful people of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Broward County here in Fort Lauderdale, where we serve 12,000 wonderful youth. And today, the CEO, Brian Quayle, presented a work skills model that we're going to be the first one in the whole United States doing that have pathways to certificates and real employment for these 12,000 at-risk youth. Now, to my knowledge, the Boys and Girls Clubs does not have a program for, quote, neurodiversity, nor have I been able to find a lot in the literature about the inner city youth. Now, I'm sure that a large percentage of our at-risk youth if they were assessed and if a project were done, would come up with different labels like all of us do, ADHD, autism spectrum, OCD, ADHD, you name it. 
What I'm looking to be able to articulate to the Boys and Girls Club is to say, look, you see what we're trying to do here at differentbrains.com? You see what a guy like Stephen Shore is doing going all over the world to spread the awareness and give people tools and give people pathways to employment and so forth? What can we do to bring that awareness nationally to the Boys and Girls Club of America from right here in Fort Lauderdale from the Boys and Girls Clubs of Broward County? All right. Well, you've got the uh, you've got the advantage of location. You're not too far away from them, and uh, uh, what it means is uh, bringing uh, information and materials about autism, and perhaps having somebody on the autism spectrum uh, meet the management and the directors of the organization, and uh, that way uh, they can get an idea of. Uh, what autism may look like, and also, more importantly, what the potential of autistic people is. Okay, so that would be something where we would call upon a world leader such as yourself and say, Stephen, come on down here, visit Hackey in Fort Lauderdale, and teach us how to get started on this. Yeah, I could see doing that. I think that would be a good idea. Whether it's me, I'd love to do it, or you get someone else to do it. The key is that it needs to be done. Okay, very good. Now, the last time we spoke, which was quite a while ago already, you were recently named to the board of Autism Speaks. And since that time, I heard it through the grapevine that you have affected big changes in latitude, changes in attitude at Autism Speaks, all for the positive. Could you enlighten our different brains audience on this? Yeah, I certainly can. And I also must say that it's only po that these changes are only possible uh, uh, by or with collaboration of others on the autism spectrum, such as Valerie Paradis, who is also on the board, and also people within Autism Speaks who don't necessarily have autism, but have come to an understanding that autism is something to be worked with as opposed to something to something that you do to. And in that way, uh, Autism Speaks now realizes that uh, chasing for a cure is like uh, a dog chasing their tail, number one. Uh, number two, it's not really a good idea to do anyways. There are some real ethical and uh, there are some real ethical concerns uh, about uh, seeking a cure and eliminating a certain type of people. Now, at the same time, I understand that uh, some of the people involved in Autism Speaks, and in particular Suzanne Wright, uh, were had children or grandchildren who were pretty severely affected with autism and had significant challenges in communication, social interaction, maybe there was some severe digestive issues and whatnot. And in these severe cases, uh, uh, they were just desperately seeking a way to re reduce uh, their children's suffering. And now they realize, and I include uh, uh, Suzanne Wright, may she rest in peace, that uh, we need to find ways of unlocking the potential of people on the autism spectrum. And I mentioned Suzanne in particular because uh, while she may have said some inflammatory things, it was towards the end of her life that I attended a breakfast uh, where she spoke. And this breakfast was for uh, the wives of various uh, 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 various ambassadors and presidents and other leaders of, of various countries, uh, Autism Speaks hosted a breakfast. And during that breakfast, she didn't talk about cure of people on the autism spectrum, but she was talking about finding ways so that for people on the autism spectrum to lead fulfilling and productive lives as adults. So I found that to be a big change. And with the incoming uh, chair of the board, 
who has a young adult on the autism spectrum, uh, he's all about supports for his child, well, now adult child, and finding ways to enable him to lead a fulfilling and productive life and to be happy with what he's doing. So that's a big change. And that culminated uh, with the change in the mission statement where Cura was dropped in favor of lifelong supports, acceptance of people on the autism spectrum, and involvement of adults on the autism spectrum within the organization. And I found this very, very encouraging, and I think we'll be able to do some really great things. You used the word in your dissertation just now that resonated very well with me as a MD, as a physician. We don't want anyone to be, quote, suffering, okay? We don't want people to suffer, no matter what the cause of the suffering is. And that's a worthy goal also. But it is a minefield to tiptoe through there without somebody getting mad at you. Yeah, that is uh, that is so true. There's a lot of strong feeling, and there's a lot of, you might say, parts or constituents to the autism community. And you also brought up a really important point, as you mentioned, as a physician, reducing suffering, uh, which suggests that while it's important to be positive and to focus on the strengths. And as you also suggested, if we find a way to match those strengths to employment, uh, we have the potential for someone to be a regional, national, or international expert on the subject. Now that said, there are also significant challenges that come with autism. They come with being on the autism spectrum and they do need to be addressed and we need to work on those. And the way I see the use of intervention, whether it be medical, whether it be sensory, whether it be educational and behavioral, is that you're helping that individual live the best life they can as someone who's on the autism spectrum. How do you see things relative to autism as one member of the spectrum of all different types of brains? In other words, what I'm seeing is, as we evolve here at Different Brains, is the, let's use different terminology. If we take neurological conditions such as Alzheimer's and strokes and Parkinsonism, and we take mental health issues such as schizophrenia and bipolar, depression, anxiety, if we take intellectual developmental differences such as autism, um, dyslexia, uh, let's throw in Down syndrome, um, all the types of different brains, I'm probably missing a couple of big categories, but forgetting labels for a minute, newer studies are showing that all these brains get wired differently and they all have some degree of neuroplasticity and the reason I'm on this campaign to get them all under one roof is to end the stigma to any of this. And let's all just work together to help each individual maximize their potential to achieve happiness, health, independence, gainful employment, and anything else we can think of. Do you see it that way or do you see it differently? That's pretty close to the way I see it. Uh, I see autism as a different way of being and not necessarily a disordered way of being. And we can say the same for many of the other conditions as well. Now that said, with autism, there are a number of things about autism that can be very disordering, uh, whether it's extreme sensory issues and you can't bear to remain in your skin. And many places are off limits to you because there's just too much sensory overload and other situations where the person on the autism spectrum has not, has not uh, acquired a reliable means of communication. That's incredibly disordering. Or if you want to go into the, the medical end of things, uh, we got some autistic people who have uh, digestive issues and may need special diets. So we do need to address these challenges. And uh, as we look at autism, 
Another way that I look at it is that uh, we're talking about a study of extremes. And that is we see may see some extreme challenges, but coupled with that, there are often corresponding extreme strengths. And that's where you get into the special interests and the special abilities. I do my work in education. Often many of the modifications and accommodations that we make for students on the autism spectrum are helpful to others as well. Uh, as I think about autism, uh, one way to consider autism is that it's a combination of a number of other conditions. Uh, with autism, you get differences in attention, as we find in uh, ADHD, for example. Uh, with autism, you see challenges in social interaction, which you also see in some other conditions, and sometimes in ADHD as well. Uh, motor control issues, which we find in other conditions. And I find that if an educator does well with teaching and supporting autistic students, then they'll probably do well with a number of other conditions. And also, as we think about the modifications and accommodations that we make for our autistic students, or if we want to telescope into adulthood, uh, for those on the spectrum who are in employment situations or in the community, uh, they often benefit others as well. And some common examples, well, you actually named one, and that is uh, keeping things structured and organized. That helps everybody. Uh, another one is lighting. Many autistic people view or perceive fluorescent lights like most people perceive a strobe light. Uh, we also know that everybody's productivity is negatively affected by fluorescent lights. So if we were to change out the lighting and maybe use natural lighting or incandescent lighting, then everybody benefits in the deal. And it often reminds me of some hotels that offer special hypoallergenic rooms and they advertise them as having hardwood floors so there isn't dust from the rugs, they're cleaned with natural products, they have all cotton, high thread uh, bed linens and so on. And my response to that is wouldn't everybody want such a hotel room? So if we make these modifications, everybody benefits. When I was given a workshop, uh, Stephen, at the uh, Broward Center for Performing Arts with a fellow I think you might know, Jose Velasco of SAP. Oh, yeah, I've done a lot of work with him. Yeah, yeah he's, he's great. And I'm head of the, the, one of the global leaders of SAP, the world's largest software company. And when he was talking about his program, we were on a panel together, he said, Hacky, Hacky, this is not a social welfare project. This is a business transition. This is good for our bottom line. It's good for our company. And that's another way of looking at it, how you can harness this to get somebody's ear in corporate America. Not to do oh, it to be good, do it to make more money. Go ahead. Yeah, he's absolutely right on that. And uh, in SAP and Microsoft and various other businesses, uh, there are autistic people uh, who are doing work better and faster than the neurotypical population. We can also include uh, the IDF as well. Yeah. I, uh, where I visited uh, during Thanksgiving uh, last year, uh, I spent about 36 hours in Israel, and a lot of that time was spent meeting with and talking with soldiers in the IDF, all who have Asperger's syndrome, and... Uh, were hired, or uh, whatever you call it when you get inducted into an army, uh, they're working there and they're recruited because they have Asperger's syndrome and because they have such visual acuity that they can see things that others may struggle to see or maybe not even see at all. And they're expanding that role to other areas as well. So not just the visual, but other aspects where People on the spectrum may have specific skills. And in the educational realm, I think about my university, Adelphi University. And we have a program, like many others have, for students with Asperger's syndrome. We've got, I think, about 150. Uh, we could double that if we had the space for them. And we, through some preliminary research, 
we found that students engaged in this program, number one, have a higher grade point average than the general student population. And then number two, they're sticking around longer. They have a better retention rate. So what, what does that mean? They're doing better, they're staying longer, they're paying more tuition dollars. And what that also suggests is the supports we're providing for students with Asperger's syndrome, might we provide them to the rest of the student population so that they can do better and be better supported and stick around longer. So again, uh, what's good for autistic people tends to be good for everybody else. And what a great segue to our friend Mitch Nagler of the Bridges to Adelphi program where you are. We had the pleasure to interview Mitch and it was very right. enlightening. And of course, uh, he's your number one fan. Yeah, exactly. And I'm his number one fan as well. He's doing great work and it's a great program. And uh, more and more schools are engaging in supports for autistic students in various ways. And there's a great diversity in the types of supports. And just like everything else, it's a matter of matching your needs to those supports. Where can people learn more about you? More information about me can be found either at my website, www.autismasperger.net. I can also be found on my channel on YouTube or at Adelphi University. And finally, if you don't remember any of this stuff, just type in my name, Stephen Shore, plus the word autism or Asperger syndrome, and a number of links will come up. Stephen, thank you so much for being with us here at another episode of Exploring Different Brains at differentbrains.com. Thank you so much for all you do. My pleasure and my honor. For more information, visit us at differentbrains.com.